I'm going to talk a, a bit about the current disease issues. This is a very uh, dynamic field right now, um, and diseases are causing probably the major cause of problems in the shrimp farming industry right now. I'm going to go briefly through the world production overview, um, look at an example of what's happened in Thailand and Ecuador as a good example of how disease affects uh, the production that's possible, look at some of the disease issues, um, and then a bit about the economic loss due to diseases, because I think it's a lot more significant than most people realize. Have a little bit of a look into some of the specific disease issues, disease issues, particularly the viral ones, and then the new, the newer ones that are emerging, like um, AHPND or EMS and EHP. Um, and then look at, uh, sorry, I've got the wrong slide up here. Um, and then look at management methods uh, for disease prevention, if there's any disease treatments and what the new product requirements might be. Um, this mimics really what uh, Alberto just put up there, which is information that's largely derived from FAO that is regurgitated by the Global Aquaculture Alliance. This was at their show in China last month. Um, and it looks a fairly positive kind of progression as the production from uh, world shrimp farming increases year on year. A couple of blips here and there, especially over the last couple of years, but the prediction is um, that it's moving forward at about 4% per year for the next few years. I think that this looks great on paper, but actually bears very little resemblance to what's the real truth. Um, and I think that looks a bit more like this. And you can see here, this is actually information using FAO figures up to 2012, but then they get a bit hairy. Um, there was a global seafood market conference in 2016, and the industry estimates were incorporated in that, and I think this gives a much more realistic picture of what's really happening. And you can see since about 2009, there's actually been a decline in production. The reason for the discrepancy between these two uh, figures is that the data provided to FAO, which forms the basis of the global aquaculture uh, estimates um, is overstated, particularly by the Chinese and the Vietnamese and to some extent the Indonesians, and that skews the whole uh, scenario. You can see still most of it is produced in Asia uh, from a peak of about 84% of shrimp production now down to about 77%, with South America taking a larger share as it's less affected by these newer diseases, particularly EMS. Having a look into the individual countries, I'm just going to use two examples, Thailand and then Ecuador, which gives a real indication of how diseases have impacted the structure and the development of these um, individual countries' aquaculture, uh, prawn farming industry. You can see at the beginning, back in 85, it was a very extensive system using wild uh, post larvae. Then the hatchery was invented and brought into production through the late 1980s, early 1990s. Then along comes uh, white spot disease. Uh, this was all for monodon in these early days. Um, uh, white spot disease came in the middle 90s, uh, put a big dent in that industry. It started to show some kinds of recovery, again with monodon, but then monodon slow growth syndrome came in and really forced the conversion uh, in Thailand and the rest of Asia from monodon into vanamai. So this was using imported SPF stocks from the uh, Latin American or the North American um, uh, uh, broodstock industry. And the combination of the introduction of vanamai and the um, SPF stocks, um, the domestication the, and selection of uh, faster growing animals, and biosecurity measures that were employed in these uh, uh, smaller Asian farms led to this explosion in the culture of Vanamai in Thailand, which led up to about 600,000 metric ton per year production. Then along came AHP and D or EMS, and you can see what kind of effect that's had, that it's halved the production or more, and continues to affect the Thai production right now. And this is a very similar situation to what's happened in the other countries that EMS has affected, including China, Vietnam, uh, uh, Malaysia. Um, by contrast, if you look at the evolution of the shrimp culture industry in Ecuador, again, we can see that there's been periodic outbreaks of disease that have come and affected the production significantly. 
This first started with IHHN back in the late 1980s. Tower came along in 92, 93, had a moderate effect for a short time. Hatcheries built up. This is for all for Vanami. Then in 1999, along came White Spot and put a serious dent in the industry. That persuaded people to start looking at uh, specific pathogen resistant strains of animals that were resistant to uh, White Spot. And that has continued today. And they are continuing to increase their production so that their pro production is now higher than that of Thailand. And they haven't yet experienced uh, EHP. If that does happen, I would expect a similar scenario to what's going on in Thailand and the rest of Asia. But right now, Ecuador's doing very nicely. In terms of the shrimp diseases, traditionally the most uh, important ones were the viral diseases, and they've developed over time, so there's now more than 20 different viruses affecting Panaid shrimp. These are often the most uh, serious and cause mass mortality in a very short period of time. But more recently, uh, the emergence of bacterial-derived de uh, diseases, like with the Vibrios that are causing EH, uh, e EMS, and now with uh, fungal problems like the EHP microsporidians and new syndromes that we still really don't know what they are, these are having more effect even than the viruses did. And then there are less serious problems like nematodes and protozoans um, and other non-infectious problems. So uh, I mentioned about this loss due to disease. Uh, there's been a lot of work done prior to the arrival of EMS looking at how much the industry has suffered due to disease. And there was various estimates, up to 40% of total production, $15 billion, 80% of which was from Asia, 12 to 19 billion since 1981, or 15% of the production, or 1.5 billion per year for the top five viral pathogens. This was all prior to EMS. As a result of this, the World Bank recommended that uh, the industry should be investing at least 275 million um, over the next 15 years to combat these viral problems. At that time, viruses were accounting for about 60% of the disease losses in shrimp aquaculture and bacteria about 20. But as I mentioned with the recent introduction of EMS or AHP and D into the scenario, that is no longer the case. This information is largely from Leitner's paper in 2011, which kind of goes through the history of, of the losses caused over time due to all these various viruses. The most significant one was white spot, both in Asia and the Americas, which was resulting in about $15 billion loss um, between 92 and uh, 2011. That's about 5% of the value of the total harvest. Then we had IMNV in Brazil and then Indonesia. And now we have AHPND, not alone, but in concert with other uh, disease issues that are occurring. And the estimate that I've derived from this is that we've lost about 40% of the total value of the harvest, um, which amounts to some 23.6 billion, with a B, dollars of about 4.8 million metric tons. That's just between 2010 and 2016. How has that played out country by country? If you look at China, the official statistics from China will tell you they're producing over a million, up to a million and a half metric ton per year. That's absolutely not true. The more likely estimate is somewhere where they've declined from about just over a million down to about 600,000 ton. This was from the Global Seafood Market report. And this is a direct result of AHP and D, EHP, and a few other diseases thrown in for good measure. Thailand, as you've seen, have gone from about 600,000 tons down to two to 300,000 tons today, and really not making a spectacular recovery as yet. Vietnam, similar scenario. They're down at about 200 to 250,000. Uh, and Malaysia, since the introduction of AHP and D, similar cause, where they've gone from 100 down to about 50,000 metric tons. EHP also went over to Latin America starting in 2013 and it entered Mexico and we had this very similar scenario where production's gone from about 100,000 ton down to 50. They made some improvement through the selection of disease resistant stocks, um, but it's quite variable. They're still struggling. If you look at that in contrast to the countries, the few countries that are not suffering from AHP and D right now, 
like Indonesia, sorry, um, we still have problems with IHN, uh, IMNV and white spot, but the production has been maintained fairly stable. India has increased its production quite a lot from uh, their 100,000 tons producing purely monodon. They changed uh, uh, belatedly to vanami, and the production has gone up quite considerably. But now they're suffering from other problems like, run, um, like uh, um, uh, running mortality syndrome, white spot periodically, and also EHP. So their production has also leveled off. And then, as I showed you before, Ecuador continues to improve in the absence of EMS. So that figure breaks down something like this to about $23.6 billion. That's just in lost production. That is shrimp that have either died or have not been produced as a result of EMS and other diseases being in the environment right now. You can add to this at least $7 billion in lost feed sales, and then there are also losses in terms of unemployment, in terms of the processing and marketing and distribution of the product that is not being produced right now. So you can see a lot of this is originating from losses in China and Thailand and to a less extent Vietnam, Malaysia and Mexico. So in terms of viral diseases, as I said 20 years ago there was very few of these around, only three or four. Now there's over 20 um, and a lot of this has been derived from the globalization of shrimp farming and the introduction of vanami from Latin America into the rest of the world. And it's brought with it, in many cases, some of the diseases that were affecting it from its home nation. Um, these, are the most, these have been the most problematic, and there's no known cure for any of them. They often cause rapid mortality, and they're often transferred from infected broodstock that are often taken from the ponds and transmitted through the hatchery, through the PL, into new sites. Um, they rely on, on transmission through wild vectors, um, typically crustaceans or through the water, but a lot of them have a very short life outside of these uh, crustacean host organisms. So if you can get rid of those, uh, those uh, vectors, then you can help to control the transmission of the disease. This is just some pictures of the various viral problems that we've seen over the years with white spot, which continues. Taura, not such an issue anymore. Also yellowhead, IHHNV, is, continues to be a problem, causing uh, runting and slow growth. This is a new one called abdominal segment deformity disease, which is also thought to be caused by a virus now, and monodon slow growth syndrome, which caused that uh, transfer from monodon to vanami in most of Asia. Then there are the white body shrimp viruses, which includes the IMNV originating in Brazil and moving over to uh, Indonesia. Macrobrachium Rosenbergi noda virus, which looks very similar to this, originally happened in Macrobrachium and then was transferred into Vanami. Panaeus Vanami noda virus, which is another very similar looking disease. And then there's a white muscle disease, which as far as we know is not caused by a virus, but looks very similar to these others. Um, this, I, th I feel I ought to kind of uh, mention about the SPF and SPR. Um, this introduction of this domesticated, selected animal from Latin America into Asia really spurred that change from monodon and that massive increase in production we saw in Asia. Um, this was because we already had the availability of these uh, SPF stocks, which had already been domesticated and in some, uh, in some instances selected for improved disease resistance and faster growth. Um, but the SPF paradigm didn't really work in these large, extensive uh, Latin American farms. They instead had to go for specific pathogen-resistant animals that were selected in the farm itself. When you stocked SBF stocks, they went into the ponds and the farms free of disease, but they didn't stay that way very long, so it didn't work out for them. There are some SPF, SBR stocks for Taura, for white spot, for IMNV now in Brazil, and lately there's been some developed for AHP India as well, both in Mexico and recently in Asia. In Asia, um, they originally started bringing in a lot of animals, the SPF animals from Hawaii, but uh, over time that number diminished and diminished as they started producing these stocks uh, themselves. But they didn't tend to uh, maintain that SPF status they started selecting animals, good performing animals from the pond, which were infected with multiple diseases. 
and that has caused um, a lot of problem for the Asian industry now. They also have some SPF selected animal, but they did that selection based purely on growth, not on disease resistance, and that has come to back to bite them with the introduction of AHP and D. So we really need to look much closer into the development of these SPF and SPR stocks to maintain our biosecurity and the ability of the animals to thrive in the presence of these multiple diseases. So living with viruses, um, as long as you keep the conditions in the pond in good condition, the environmental condition, um, a, a lot of uh, occasions the shrimp can be infected with multiple viruses, but if you maintain water quality and dissolved oxygen and nutrition, you can get a successful harvest. It's all about the management. There's no treatment for these viruses, but you can still get a good return a lot of the time if you take a lot of care with how you culture your animals. We've had some progress in the development of vaccines, um, but shrimp don't really have an immune system, the, so a true vaccine doesn't really work on shrimp, but there have been some examples which I'll go into later which have shown some promise. So basically in the absence of, of real treatments for viruses, we really need to use best management practices uh, to improve uh, the management of our farms using SPF and SPR animals. That's about the only way we can survive. Then we move on to the non-viral problems. And principle of these, I'm really going to talk about EMS um, and uh, white feces syndrome and this EHP caused by microsporidians. There's a couple of others too. EMS, we all know what that looks like. You get this uh, uh, whitened and shrunken hepatopancreas. Um, animals dying very, very early, uh, even before they're a week or two old in the ponds. So this, this originated in China in 2009 and affected very young animals within the first month of culture. It went into Vietnam, Malaysia, Thailand, uh, East Malaysia and the Philippines um, in 2010-11. And then 2013, it got into Mexico. We're not sure how. And from Mexico, it's spreading out through other countries in uh, Central America. And just last year, there was a new variety of this that popped its head up in Australia last year. And we're still not really sure uh, how significant that's going to be. That's in monodon. But they call it Peneus monodon mortality syndrome, not AHP and D, because there's some differences uh, between the characteristics of the Asian version and the Australian version. Um, we know it affects monodon and vanami. Interestingly, there is a domesticated strain of merguensis in Australia, and so far it has remained unaffected. Even in farms that are infected with the monodon, the merguensis are free of it. It's quite an interesting result. The actual problem causes this destruction of the hepatopancreas and rapid mortality, up to 100% within a few days. Um, and it, for a long time, it went undiagnosed. It wasn't until 2013 that uh, Dr. Leitner um, found that it was actually being caused by uh, a, a strain of Vibrio parahemolyticus that became infected uh, with a plasmid that carried a couple of toxin genes, um, which, when expressed, uh, destroyed the shrimp hepatopancreas. Recent research has shown that other bacterial species can also be infected by similar plasmids. So we've got uh, uh, the outbreak in Australia is not caused by Vibrio parahemolyticus, but it's caused by Vibrio harvii uh, infected with this plasmid. Um, but HPND gets a lot of blame, but it doesn't act alone. In many cases, it's there in the pond, and people point their finger and say it's EMS or HPND. But in many cases, that's not true. A lot of the a survey done in Thailand showed that only 20% of the mortality in those in dying ponds was actually caused by AHP and D. And there are a number of other disease issues which were causing more mortality than the, than the EMS. Um, and that includes white spot, EHP, ATM, and other species of bacteria like Shiwanella and Delftia, which exacerbate the problem caused by EMS. Now we have uh, various PCR primers to identify both the strain of bacteria and the, pr and the toxins so we can look at where it's coming from, how it's being transmitted and how it gets from one farm to another or from the hatchery to the farm. Previously we didn't have that, so now we have a way of finding out what's going on. 
So the transmission is from the environment to the stomach of the infected shrimp. Um, all the biosecurity uh, measures that farms adopted to cope with viruses don't work anymore for bacteria. Um, so we've had to rethink the whole system. The bacteria can even be carried in droplets of water and be spread from pond to pond and farm to farm. It's also spread widely through PLs from the hatchery. Um, and we don't really still know very much about how to control it. People have been using a lot of antibiotics and a lot of probiotics, and they haven't really been very effective so far. There isn't much risk of importing it in frozen or cooked product as the bacteria and the plasmid is killed by freezing or cooking, but we're still not sure if it can be brought in by ballast water from ships, but that's a distinct possibility as well. Um, in terms of epidemiology, we've looked at what people do that are successful, and we found that newer farms far from the sea using low salinity have been effective, reducing stocking density, increasing aeration, bioflock systems, polyculture with tilapia, using good quality seed from broodstock selected for disease resistance, um, removing sludge from the pond, including this thing called the shrimp toilet, which is basically accumulating all the, the sludge and then we can get rid of it out of the pond. Strict feeding control, very important. Um, you have to stop and re reduce and stop the feeding. Uh, as soon as you notice the problem coming, that helps them to recover from it and the use of better quality feeds which promote the stock health and the, and the disease resistance of the animals. This is a picture of the shrimp toilet and the water that's coming out of it. So when it's black like this, you keep flushing the bottom of the pond until it turns clear, uh, then you turn it off. I'm not gonna go through this one. The other problem that has reared its head recently is this microsporidian uh, uh, parasite, which is a kind of fungi really. And we found that this now occurs in up to 50% of the ponds. It's very difficult to get rid of it. Um, we just have to maintain the environment as clean as possible. The broodstock are clean and free of it. The PL likewise. We clean the farm and we clean the water. If the ponds become heavily infected, you just have to harvest them and get rid of the animals. There's no other way of, of uh, surviving with it. Unfortunately, the spores of this microsporidian are transferred directly from shrimp to shrimp, which is quite unusual for microsporidian, which makes it very difficult. Um, and the shrimp just, they don't die, but they don't grow more than 12 grams, so they've got less value, and the cost of culture is higher than the value you get for those shrimp at the end of the day. So for management methods for disease prevention, you've got biosecurity, very, very difficult with bacteria or with microsporidians. There's pond preparation, uh, the sediment and uh, uh, water and sediment quality control. This is really important. Reconfiguration of ponds, whereby before all of the ponds of your farm, or virtually all of them, were used for production. Now they're converting a lot of those ponds into reservoirs and recirculation and bioremediation, up to 60% of them. That's quite effective. Using high quality nursed SPF, SPR um, seed and using high quality diets with controlled feeding. All very important. New techniques, bioflock management technology. I'm sure Dr. Samoko will explain a lot about that. Low salinity culture. High intensity lined recirculating farms are now in use. This polyculture I mentioned with tilapia is very effective. Um, and using less, uh, more natural, less intensive systems is also gaining favor in places like Thailand and the production of SPF and SPR animals. Treatments, there really aren't any. Um, we have been on the path of gradually replacing the use of antibiotics with things like probiotics or, or um, organic acids, phytochemicals, immunostimulants and bacteriophages. But uh, in the desperation, a lot of the Asian farmers are falling back into the use of illegal antibiotics. It's a really significant problem. Um, using bioflocks, uh, and dietary addition of bioflock meals is quite successful. And then there's antimicrobials, acidifiers, monoglycerides, fucoidin, seaweed extracts. All of these can be effective under if you've got your management uh, working properly. Last slide, in terms of the new product requirements that we really need to help us to fight these diseases, immunostimulants and vaccines, uh, probiotics. We can design specific probiotics to uh, deliberately target these bacteria that are causing the, the, the current problems with EMS. 
Bacteriophages have been shown to have some effect against EMS as well. Quorum sensing inhibitors to prevent the toxin production, stop the bacteria from switching on their, their uh, signals that tell the whole population to start producing the toxins. Uh, toxin binders, mineral supplements, prebiotics, phytogenics, disinfectants, and then other effective treatments for other environmental problems that we're experiencing in the farms. That's it. Thank you.